Give me just a moment. Whenever I go to present, it switches the monitors on me. So hang, hang with me here just a moment. There we go. Now we're seeing it. OK, so everyone can uh, see and, and, uh, and hear me uh, properly, I hope. Yeah, it looks good. OK, so. great. So um, I'll start off. Thank you uh, first, Megan, for the introduction. And um, thank you, everyone, for uh, for taking your time out of your Wednesday morning. Uh, I promise this won't be too exhaustive or too lengthy or too wordy. Um, what I'm going to be going over mostly today is TraceCalc Pro, which is our heat tracing design software um, catered specifically to heat loss calculations and designs of heat trace systems on piping and vessels. Uh, the first few slides in this presentation are going to be on the just a very quick brief overview on the fundamentals of heat tracing and how it works and clearing up one main misconception of electrical heat tracing. And then we'll get into a couple different slides with the uh, software itself. And then um, once I get through that, uh, I have uh, a sample demo opened up on, uh, and I'll share that screen when, when the time comes for uh, just showing the actual software itself and some little tips and tricks and easy way to make changes if you are involved in an in a existing design um, with some heat tracing uh, software that ours are called TraceCalc. So um, I'll get started here. So basics of electrical heat tracing uh, and the misconception I like to clear up is that very often uh, people will mistake uh, heat tracing for a system that is uh, designed primarily for heating up uh, a system or whether it's piping or tanks or filters, something, something, some piece of equipment. Um, so what the misconception is, is that we're trying to raise the temperature when really what heat tracing is designed to do is maintain an existing temperature or prevent or match any heat loss through insulation. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about briefly here. Now, that doesn't mean that we cannot heat up a system. Um, what this is really explaining is that heat tracing is not typically and rarely used for a heat up application. We can do it in some instances. But typically, it's for shorter runs, um, small deltas in temperature, um, and it does take uh, typically longer than most people would uh, would expect. Um, and we can show you in the design software some calculations going forward on that time that it really takes to heat something up, if anyone is interested. But keep in mind that heat tracing is is almost always designed to kind of calculate the the heat being lost through a pipe through the insulation, out of a pipe, through the insulation, and replacing that amount of heat loss with the heating cable just to maintain that desired temperature, whether it's 40 degrees for freeze protection or 100 and some degrees for a process flow. So you can see here, um, there's just a reiteration of what I just mentioned, is that um, we are calculating the amount of heat loss of the insulation on a particular pipe and replacing that with the heat. So here's an example we have uh, in this sample that we have a three inch diameter outdoor water line, uh, no flow. And uh, no flow is a good reminder for me in that another thing that tip, uh, typically heat tracing is used for is stagnant or no flow situations. When something is flowing, to, uh, tr heat trace typically and rarely has enough output to really add enough heat to a flowing medium. So it's typically for a pipe that is stagnant and is uh, out in, uh, it has a delta between the ambient temperature and the temperature you'd like to maintain. Uh, the extreme example that you see here is a typical three inch pipe, no insulation, nothing covering it, no heat trace, and what happens to that pipe out in the ambient environment. It's uh, pretty typical and pretty obvious what would happen is that if you have a pipe that you'd like to maintain at 40 degrees, and in this particular situation, we have a minus 25 degree Fahrenheit minimum ambient, that pipe will freeze, and we calculated that in this situation, with no insulation, no heat trace, that pipe would freeze in less than an hour's time. Uh, another important note is you can see a very high heat loss. 
that is 100 watts of energy uh, per foot, linear foot of pipe is being lost through the wall of that pipe in this particular situation. And that's what we're going to combat with two things being insulation and uh, further with heat tracing. So now we have the, the, the second graduation of this, uh, this analogy here is we have now we have a pipe with no heat tracing, just insulation. Um, you can see that uh, the insulation will obviously, obviously slow down that amount of heat loss, but it won't prevent it. Uh, the, the best insulation that you can find will have some level of energy ingress from the pipe wall through the insulation into the ambient environment. So when you have a pipe that you're, you're confident will freeze or has the potential of freezing up, it's another common misconception is that oh, I'll insulate it and it will be fine. That may be the case, it may not. Um, most uh, commonly that insulation will buy you some time, but will not prevent it indefinitely from freezing up. It'll just slow the process. And that's what it's showing here in that the 10 to 20 hours to freeze versus the less than an hour with no insulation. And you can see that our heat loss now has greatly decreased from approximately 100 watts per foot, a linear foot of pipe, to around 5 to 8 just with one layer of insulation. So here you can see again, um, this is just a little bit of what I had mentioned verbally, uh, showing you in a graph of uh, what would happen. So that fluid temperature would slowly decrease and get to a freezing temperature with the insulation. Um, but it will, again, it will freeze over time, depending on how much time is based on ambient conditions, the, the fluid that's in the pipe, and so on and so forth. Um, and the goal with the trace is not really to increase that temperature. You see that line on the bottom, bottom chart is, is completely horizontal. We're not trying to raise the temperature of the pipe. We're just probably preventing the temperature from decreasing below 40 degrees in a typical application for freezing. Again, making up the heat loss. So as you remember earlier, we had around a five to eight watt heat loss calculated. So what do we do since we're not trying to heat it up, we're just trying to replace that heat loss is we are putting a, an eight watt per foot cable on that line so that any energy being lost through the insulation is being replaced by that heating cable, keeping that temperature where we need it to be. So that's the first, um, you know, just get that in everyone's mind is that we're not heating things up. We're just trying to maintain an existing temperature. So based on that, uh, and the reason I went over that first is that that kind of tells you what this entire tool is really based around and what our goals are with our calculations. Um, again, we can do heat up calculations in very rare occasions. I've been doing this for uh, many years and there's only been a handful of times that I've um, done designs and completed designs and, and installations that involved a heat up of, uh, of an application. And for example, uh, the one in, that comes to mind uh, locally in Philadelphia was the pipe was around 75 foot in length. Um, we were trying to achieve, achieve a heat up of, I think it was 20 some degrees in a 75 foot length of pipe with low flow, low flow rate. And it still uh, was very, it took about six to seven passes of cable to get to achieve that. So you can see when you really want to heat something up in a short period of time, you need something, a different product, a different technology, other than heat tracing to really put in the amount of energy that's required in most cases. So TraceCal Pro is our own homegrown proprietary uh, software for the design of heat tracing systems as well as calculating the heat loss of pipe uh, tanks, equipment that are in line to pipe, pretty much anything that you can, you can insulate and you want to protect from freezing, we can pretty much heat it up. Uh, we've done hopper heaters, we've done catch pans, obviously uh, tanks and piping, a lot of things through the years that we can do. Um, even if I didn't mention it, if you're unsure, uh, you can send me some drawings, send me some information, and I can take a look at it and see if we can, uh, if we can heat this thing up. So um, whenever you get into a design, uh, we're not going to focus today on large projects with numerous lines. The, the example I'll show you later in the software is just a couple lines in a single tank. But there's, um, there's always the basic and fundamental information you really need to gather prior to getting into the software and, and really beginning a design. Um, and that's what's really listed here. Uh, you need your pipe, uh, the diameter of the pipe, how many heat sinks are within that pipe run, heat sinks being your flanges, your valves, your supports, anything in that line 
or, or something that touches that pipe that would be a heat sink and pull heat away from that pipe. We need to account for all of that. Um, also, the insulation type and thickness, um, temperature, temperatures as far as the minimum ambient temperature, um, the temperature you want to maintain. Uh, wind speed is kind of uh, not as important always, but we typically put in a 20 mile an hour wind speed of a constant wind speed. Um, unless it is in a, an environment where we know that's going to be, uh, let's if it's in a corridor that gets heavy gusts or it's by a fan, something like that, we can adjust the wind speed. And also the safety factor. We have a couple different safety factors. Uh, we have a few, but the main two safety factors that are that play into your general design uh, of a heat tracing system is our heat loss safety factor, as far as how how stringent we are with our heat loss calculations. And the second safety factor that's commonly used is the pipe length safety factor. Um, pipe length is that when uh, we're often going out on site, looking at existing piping, taking manual measurements, and sometimes uh, we can't reach all the pipe, can't get an accurate measurement, so we're not 100% confident in the dimensions that we took, we can adjust the safety factor in length. For example, a 10% adder on the length of pipe we're estimating so that it calculates in extra cable so we don't run short. There are the basic safety factors that we'll, uh, we'll be dealing with in, in our fundamental heat trace designs. Uh, I'll get into a little more of this once I switch over to the, uh, to the trace calc software, but this will look very familiar. You can see just the fundamentals of a, of a visual here. Um, the Explorer pane that will show you, that will list all of your actual pipes, including, uh, like for example, a header pipe and a T or a branch or an extension off of that header. Um, all will be under the piping section. And then there's a, a vessel section that's separated out as well. And that will be listed in there. You can scroll to the right after you select any branch piping or vessel, and it will show you the, the basics. The basic tab is your most important tab. Uh, and that's going to give you all, it's going to ask you all the, the fundamental requirements of, of designing heat tracing system. So uh, another thing I use TraceCal for, and still to this day, is that when I'm on the phone or I'm thinking about a design or going through uh, having a, a discussion about a particular design, I will open up TraceCalc and look at it because it's basically going to remind you and it's going to tell you and guide you through all of the information that you need to gather to properly design this, this heat tracing system. So if you're ever unsure of what questions to ask when you're gathering information um, to come up with a bill material for a heat trace system, I, what I use is I open up trace calc, I look at it, and then I just go down the basics here. You can see the pipe type, the diameter, the length. These are all the questions that you need to ask to properly gather the information. So instead of having a separate document listing out the, the questions and things that we typically need to gather for a heat trace design, I personally open up trace calc, look at all of it, and it goes through all the information, um, a lot of times more than we need to know in, in some instances. One great thing about this software as well, as opposed to um, uh, the handful of other design tools that are out there, is we have by far the best exports and in, in, in data uh, sharing with, with this tool. You look at the results pane and it will give you all of the data from uh, raw heat loss data, nothing specific or proprietary uh, to, to Raychem at all. Um, we can export a bill of material with all of the Raychem part numbers uh, for ease of, of uh, ordering material. However, we don't hide the, the data that goes behind those calculations. So, um, if, for example, I will often use and help out some uh, engineers or designers when they're trying to heat up a tank. Um, for example, if they have a, an immersion heater or some other type of heat exchanger, or something else that they're really they want to heat the tank with other than heat tracing, I can still assist them in this is an example in figuring out what the heat loss and how much energy they'll need to put into that tank um, using this software because it does give you the raw output data and the raw heat loss of, of your piping systems and your tanks and equipment for the design. So talking about design outputs. Um, the product selection, uh, we'll, I'll show you uh, momentarily um, the, the outputs as far as it'll give you a complete bill material down to everything that uh, the installer needs, including the heat, heating cable type, the length, all your power connection kits, your end seals, all the way down to your tape and label. So pretty much everything that you can, you can generate from this is uh, it creates a, a kit, for lack of a better term, to properly address the system that's being designed. So you have, you know, 
put it all in one skid, everything on the bill material, he can hit the ground running, he's not stopping and looking any room for else. Um, also along with that, we have very good exports and then outputs um, with the electrical data that you need for sizing transformers, panels, um, your power distribution wire, so on and so forth. Um, also confirmations of all the calculated temperature values. And there's some other reports that come out. She will go over the single line details, the electrical line list, the summary line list, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, the bill material in case the uh, product would need to be purchased. So now I'll just get into the, uh, the live demo of uh, get right into trace calc. Just a moment here while I switch over. Okay, I imagine uh, if someone is, or if anyone is unable to see the trace calc sample I have up, please uh, let me know, and uh, I will uh, adjust it accordingly. But on my end, it looks like it is being shared properly. So what I have here is just a few sample lines that I just created earlier this morning as an example to show you uh, how I would go through and <clears throat> attempt or attack a design. Um, so. The first example I have here is, is a caustic line. Um, the what I always the first thing I usually look for when I'm doing a design is if I'm going to create it myself or ask for if there's a there's a heat trace line list. The line list typically has almost all, if not a large majority, of the data you need to input here um, for for the design of the system. So this one I have labeled a caustic line. It's a free type area. You can select right over here. You can name it whatever you want. Um, uh, then we get back down right into the meat of the project, which is the pipe type. Now, this one is, uh, if you're unsure what these, these acronyms are here, you select the down um, arrow here, and you can see exactly what it is. So this is a carbon steel pipe. Um, when you switch between carbon steel and copper and, and other types of metal pipe, galvanized, whatever it is, the long as the diameter is the same, the heat loss typically does not change a whole lot. Where you will get a good change in heat loss is when you go from a steel or metal or any type of metal or metallic pipe down to a plastic PVC, CPVC, polyethylene, whatever that pipe is. You will get a, a somewhat of a difference there. So it is important to choose the proper pipe material, not just the diameter. So in this particular case, I randomly chose carbon steel schedule 80 pipe. Um, then you get into the size of the pipe, one inch diameter, the length of the pipe, 125 foot in length, and that is straight length, um, not including valves, flanges, and supports. We'll get into that in the next tab here. So within that pipe run, if you have an isometric drawing there, you can really see how you can just start filling out this information. Carbon steel pipe, one inch diameter, 125 length of, uh, of piping, and then we're gonna get into the appurtenances within that pipeline, valve, support, flanges, and I'll explain why those are important as well. So when you get in here, you can start putting in the types of valves, the types of supports, the types of flanges, and you can manually put in or have it, or have it automatically calculate the, uh, based on, you know, for example, for the supports, the amount of supports per uh, tent, like see, for example, 10 foot intervals, this one's a 6.6 .6 foot interval. So it's calculating the amount of supports you have in this particular line. So if you're ever curious as to why, so when you have a straight run of pipe, that's what we're calculating our heat loss of, off of. So uh, in the earlier example where we came up with a three inch diameter pipe with two inches of insulation and the heat loss was between five and eight watts per foot and we used an eight watt cable, um, that is for the straight spool length of pipe per linear foot. Obviously when you come up to a large valve or if there is a flange or if there is a steel support connected to that pipe, that's gonna be an additional heat loss over and above the five to eight watts per foot heat loss. So how do you combat that? You combat that by putting a wrap or an S or some type of configuration, depending on the type of item it is, around that item to compensate for the additional heat loss in that particular area. Why that's important here is that in the total length of pipe. So for example, in this, this scenario, we have 125 feet of pipe. 
Um, very another common misconception will say, okay, I have 125 feet of pipe, I need 125 feet of cable. Um, on average, uh, on, on a lot of these projects, depending on how busy the piping is, um, you are looking at, if you have 100 feet of pipe, it is not uncommon for you to require 150 feet of cable on a 100 foot pipe because of valves, flanges, supports. There's also service loops, um, additional loops of cable at your components, your power connection kits and end seals. So it does add up quickly. So to give you an example, I have this line here. We have 125 feet of pipe. We have, let's just say we have, we have nine valves in there. We have some supports. We have a flange. And we're also putting in here a percentage of pipe length, 10%. So we weren't sure how accurate we were with the 125 foot measurement. So we feel comfortable adding 10% adder onto that length just to cover ourselves. We're gonna calculate that line by hitting this button right here. You're gonna see it's gonna think. And then up here you can go and you'll see bill material for that particular current pipe. So in this example, we have 125 feet of pipe and we have 177 feet of cable. It's a pretty big jump, um, and that's be that's because of the valves, flanges, and supports that we need to wrap, as well as well as the service loops for each of your components here, being the power connection kit and your end seal. So that's very uh, very common to have that type of ratio of pipe to cable. Going down to the next section, I'm going to insulation. Another, uh, and these are all very important. This first basic tab is, is the fundamentals and very important. You need to get all these information minimum. Going further, we can uh, finally tune the design further with these different tabs in different areas, but this is kind of the meat and potatoes of a heat trace design. Um, so now we're at the insulation type. Now there are a bunch of different types in this drop down menu. Um, you can you can get data on each of those. That's a separate subject to find uh, to get into the really nitty gritty details here. But this one, mineral wool type three, which is your general mineral wool insulation type, um, which is uh, I think a better equivalent to a fiberglass with some additional properties. Um, and the, we have chose since it's a one inch diameter pipe, we're only going to have one inch of thickness of insulation. We could do less. But in this particular situation, we're saying one inch thick insulation. So that's going to help with our heat loss calculations. Then we get over here. Since this is a caustic line, we're going to maintain 85 degrees in the particular line. And what we're saying here is that this is in the, nor in the northeast United States, which is the region that I cover. Um, unless we're up really in the northern Maine, um, I typically use a minus 10 minimum ambient for this region. Uh, it rarely... Uh, I can't remember the last time uh, it was recorded below minus 10 in this region, so I use minus 10 as my standard that can be adjusted easily. Um, the maximum ambient temperature is something that I typically don't adjust heavily, um, 104 degrees, that's, uh, that's typically pretty hot, and it's not going to play into a whole lot of the heat trace uh, design criteria. However, the heater exposure is a very important one here, and there's a reason it's on this basic tab. And I'll get into briefly um, why that's important. So um, a, a common uh, thought is that what you're really trying to, and what you're only thinking about with heat trace is the temperature that you're trying to maintain. Um, but there are two things. We are, there are maintained temperature for, exist, for this example, 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but the maximum heater exposure is another very important design criteria. Now, why would that be important? And what example would that be relevant? Um, for example, uh, in pharmaceutical companies, as an example, they will have a line that they are maintaining, let's say, in this uh, caustic line at 85 degrees. Uh, periodically, um, they may purge that line with steam to clean it for whatever reasons or sanitize it. That steam purge can be uh, well above 140 degrees, depending on the pressure of that steam. So what happens is when there's a system designed and you uh, don't factor in for intermittent exposure temperatures to that cable, meaning an outside source, heat source, whether it's the process or whether it's steam cleaning, that cable is going to be exposed since it's laying right next to that pipe and has good contact with that pipe <clears throat> to whatever temperature that steam is, or whatever that fluid is, and that process is flowing through there. Now, 140 degrees tells us, okay, that, that means we can use our BTV family of cable. So if you look here in the bill material, we have BTV cable, which is our standard run-of-the-mill black sheathed cable 
for most commonly used for freeze protection and low maintain temperatures. Um, now, for example, if we said this temperature is, or this particular pipe is going to be exposed to an intermittent purges of steam up to 225 degrees, and then we recalculate, the heat loss doesn't change. You can see here, max, so we'll go back here, I'm sorry, maximum heat exposure, 140, and we calculate. Our heat loss is 4.37 watts per foot, tells us right here. 25, that's the heater exposure. Hasn't changed a bit. However, there's a different cable in here now. So what that cable is doing is it still has the job and is capable of maintaining that 85 degree temperature. So why did the temperature change? Is that that particular family of cables, the QTV versus the BTV, which was selected earlier, that, that cable can withstand intermittent or, or environmental temperatures without degrading. Um, the most extreme example and a, and a personal example, and I won't mention the company name, but it was a large tank farm here uh, in, uh, in the in New York region in that we did a, a really large project. Um, it was their unloading lines from their barges. Uh, when, we, when we got involved in the design, we went through all these design parameters, the basic design parameters, and we said, okay, what is your maximum heater exposure? And they asked what the definition of that was. And we said, well, do you ever purge these lines with steam? Do they ever, through the process, is any material being pushed through these pipes that's above 140 degrees? The answer was no, we don't purge it with steam. It just, it just whatever, and our process piping and the, and the fluid coming in is nothing above 100 degree Fahrenheit. So that told us, and we confirmed it with them, that you can use our BTV family of cable uh, for that particular application. Um, a year goes by, winter comes along, next thing you know, the pipe has frozen up in numerous spots all on this long pipeline, and we couldn't figure out why. The cable wasn't measuring bad, it wasn't tripping out, um, nothing was happening except for lack of heat and freezing pipes. What we found out was that the barges pulling up um, during the winter time, uh, going to numerous facilities, would often run into uh, problems with some of the uh, unloading piping and that they were already blocked or frozen from sitting there and not being traced and maintained at the, at the right temperature. So they had, uh, so, some of the workers had formed habits of, before they were unloading, they would purge that line with steam to clear it out so then they wouldn't have any problem offloading. Um, not knowing that that intermittent exposure, that high temperature was basically killing or destroying or degrading the, that particular BTV cable because that cable wasn't designed to withstand those high temperatures. So that's an extreme example of what can happen. Um, which is why it's important to choose the right cable, and it's not just based on output as far as, uh, you know, 3, 5, 8, 10 watts per foot. It's not just going up higher. It's a different family. So if you looked at our full family of cables, you would see what seems to be redundancy in that we have numerous cables that have the same output. We have a 10 BTV, we have a 10 QTV, and we have a 10 XTV, and so on cables, all in different families. So it seems like, well, why would we have the same output cable um, over and over again, just with different names. It's exposure temperature is one of the main reasons, along with a few other technical uh, changes in there. But that's a that's definitely a big one, which is why I just spent some time on that talking about heater exposure. It's something that's often overlooked and can be very problematic after the fact. Problematic after the fact, um, obviously, other than the, the fact that it can degrade the cable and destroy it and freeze up the pipes. It's also very, uh, it can be difficult to, to figure out what's going on. So for example, that BTV cable that I mentioned that was intermittently exposed to that high, high temperature steam, what happens to the cable is it doesn't give you really any warning. Uh, it gives you very minimal warning that, that a problem is happening. It won't trip out on ground fault, definitely won't trip out on overcurrent. Um, what will happen is, is that cable just, it degrades the action or the life or the output of that cable. So the only way to really tell is to do load calculations and, and do some, some estimating saying, I have X amount of foot of cable. When I installed it, we have estimated it to be an output of 13 amps on this particular line and now we're at three, what's going on? Um, that's the only real indication. Even if you mega test that cable with a 2,500 volt, five, any volt mega, it is not really gonna give you any indication that 
that cable has been damaged due to heat exposure. So it's really good to get that that design criteria um, out there and confirm before you design a system. So we'll move on to the next uh, of the fundamentals. I won't harp on that any longer. <clears throat> then, then we get into the electrical data. Um, really fundamentals, your, your voltage and your amperage. Voltage and amperage is very important as well in that we have two uh, of each of our cable types, for example, 10 QTBR2, we have uh, two cables, one for 208 up to 277 volts is one family of cables and anywhere from 100 to 120 volts is a separate family of cables. So voltages, differing voltages can determine different cables that need to be shipped out and designed with on site. The other thing that the voltage <clears throat> and amperage does is that it gives us our maximum circuit length. So for example, if you had one pipe runner that was 2000 feet long, um, you would typically have more than one heat tray circuit on that line. Um, so what this software will do for you is it will calculate the maximum circuit length of that, of that particular heating cable. And I'll talk a little bit about maximum circuit length in that maximum circuit length is, uh, is often miscalculated in that people want to uh, use Ohm's law. They will look at the cable, they will say, okay, it's listed at eight watts per foot. I have, and they'll start using Ohm's law based on the voltage and amperage that they have available. The problem with that is um, when, if you do that, and you do that strictly, you will almost always get overcurrent trips on startup. Self-regulating cable, similar to an electric motor, has an inrush current. Um, and to give you an example and a little explanation, any cable in the industry, ours or competitors, they're they are all listed at, and they have a wattage output, for example, and this one are right here, 10 watts per foot. What the industry has decided is that we are going to label our cables on what that cable's output is, in this one 10 watts per foot, when that cable is in a 50 degree Fahrenheit ambient environment. So basically when you see that labeling on the cable, and that labeling is whatever that output is, that's when that cable is at 50. Now it's self-regulated. So for example, now if that ambient temperature dips down well below 50, let's say zero, that temperature or that output can double. So you can see that it's even though if you start using Ohm's law, and you start like, okay, I'm going to I'm going to extend this circuit out X amount of feet, and then you start up that system, and that system on a cold winter day is much less than 50 degrees Fahrenheit, you will be pulling double the amperage that you had uh, expected to be pulling. So that's just another important little catch and something to keep in mind um, when uh, when you're designing these systems. Next, since we're running a little short on time here, and I promised I wouldn't take too long, um, I'm going to get into the tanks. The, the tank is a, is a great tool. Um, uh, we added this on, I don't know how many years ago, but it wasn't always uh, in this software. And it's a, it's a great little option for us. Um, <clears throat> when you get into the water, um, in this particular situation, it's a water tank, you'll get into your vessel properties right here. Um, you're gonna look at the shape of the tank, the configuration, flat bottom, and also how it's supported. How it's supported is very important in, in heat loss calculations for tanks. For example, if this is this particular tank is not on on the legs and it is flat bottom that is uninsulated and it's sitting right on a slab, that is a big big heat sink right there. So that so putting it on this this slab versus um, let's say legs, that is a big change in heat loss calculations. So make sure you you, you factor that into it as well. And then everything else is pretty self-explanatory that you see along here. You're going to put in the diameter of the tank, the height, um, minimum fill height, maximum fill height, which is pretty much automatically calculated. And I always use these as worst case scenario. And the available area defaults to 33% because of our design uh, standards. We can get in that at a different time if anyone has any questions. Also, the material of the tank, whether it's an FRP, plastic, metallic, so on and so forth. So putting in this information is your basic information on the actual physical tank itself. Other than that, you have a very similar situations to the piping. You have your insulation type, and then your thickness being chosen, your electrical data, and then your temperature data, maintaining 50 degrees and a minus 10 minimum ambient area. Um, we will, I'm going to spend a few more minutes and then uh, I will cut this short and then let anyone stay on longer or uh, I can give you my contact information if you have any additional questions or you need help on a particular 
um, design that you're currently working on, feel free to reach out. Um, but we go in these other tabs, um, you can put in some additional information, whether it's indoor or outdoors, which obviously would remove the wind speed, chemical exposures, startup temperatures, heat loss safety factors, which is another important one. Um, area classification is another important one as well. By, by default, all of our industrial equipment is rated by, for class one division two areas. We do have a complete separate line of cable and components when we get into class one division one areas. So keep that in mind as well. Even if you have non hazard if you choose non-hazardous here, it will still come up with a class one division two rated cable uh, for that reason by default it is that. Um, that is pretty much everything that I know I went a little bit over, so I apologize if I kept anyone longer than they needed to. But uh, that is um, that is about every, that's the fundamentals of the heat trace right there. Getting a little bit into the tanks, a um, little bit into the piping. Um, we can get into the exports uh, of some of these for, uh, for example, a detail report of this tank. If anyone wants to, to do something further with this, uh, a one-on-one -on -one in person or just uh, a quick phone call or emails, I can get into some of the exports that I was somewhat boasting about earlier and that we share a lot of information uh, in, in our heat loss calculations. We don't hide anything saying, okay, thanks for the input, uh, thanks for the design information, here's what you need to buy. It's not just that. It gives you all the raw data that you would need to, to make your own decisions and buy pretty much whatever you need or heat this tank and piping in any way that you, you see is sufficient. And this just gives you an example of how we break down some of the heat losses uh, uh, for a particular tank. And this is a vessel on this particular uh, not piping, but it gives you a lot of data and information. So um, I, will, uh, I will close this out and um, leave it open for any questions. Hey, Ryan, thank you. Get back to the uh, screen here. All right. That, that is it. Megan, do you, do you have any uh, closing words for us? Hey, Ryan, no, um, thank you. I think you covered a lot. It kind of... Uh, it opens up the door for a 201 class, it looks like. But thanks again for your time, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Yeah, again, it was uh, it was short and sweet. There's a I could talk about this much longer, but it's just kind of just uh, throwing it out there, exposing everyone to the tool and some of the fundamentals of it. And um, if there's anything else that you need, definitely call me. I've been using this tool for years. Um, I can help you out um, and uh, with any design that you have. And that's hey, it. Ryan. Ryan, could you share your contact information, please? Absolutely. I can uh, actually. I can probably send it out to the group here. I don't know how to. I'm not we really sure how to share the screen email. with all my contact information. Maybe on a chat. Yeah, we can send a follow-up email to everybody, okay. and uh, and include our information on there if you want. That'd be great. Thank you much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, take care, everyone. I appreciate the time. Thanks, Ryan. Bye-bye.